Chicago, a sparkling metropolis, home to some of the most exciting experiments in modern architecture. You can find all the 20th century's dreams of a brand new future here. For the rise of Chicago and the architecture it created defines the very essence of modernism. Rapture with the past, total belief in the new. But unlike the straight, clean lines of these buildings, the story of modernism is full of strange turns and hidden twists. In 1830, Chicago was an obscure trading post with less than 50 people. By 1890, the population had boomed to over 4 million. But nobody would have chosen this remote, swampy site on the Great Lakes to build a city. Chicago was a triumph of big ideals and crazy speculation. To achieve the impossible, swamps were drained, the flow of rivers reversed. It was, said the architect Louis Sullivan, all magnificent and wild, a crude extravaganza, an intoxicating rawness, a sense of big things to be done. And it was here that Sullivan and other architects built the world's first dense cluster of skyscrapers. They pioneered the use of steel frames, glass and concrete, the newest metals. The impact of these gigantic towers was a dizzying sight in the 1890s. It was the invention of the elevator that allowed buildings to reach such spectacular heights. Some visitors were so excited by the experience of traveling in these first lifts that they offered to pay for the ride. Elevators, together with the most up-to-date electrical and mechanical wizardry, symbolized a Chicago that was destiny, progress, everything that was to carry the 19th century to its appointed future. Nothing could stop Chicago inventing itself. Perhaps the most flamboyant invention of all was the White City. Built for the Chicago World Fair of 1893, more than 27 million people visited this amazing exhibition. It was considered one of the seven wonders of the world. Its attraction lay in its very whiteness. Here was a vision of the city that was radiantly clean. Yet the White City was only an elaborate stage set and was torn down when the World Fair closed. The reality of Chicago was very different. All Chicago's wild expansion had been achieved at a fearful cost. As railroads and canals brought vast quantities of lumber, grain and livestock to the city, the industrial waste piled up around its inhabitants. Chicago became the dirtiest place on earth. The air was thick with grease from factory chimneys. Children drowned in the mud of its unpaved streets. The drainage systems couldn't hold back the swamps. Houses sat on raw sewage. And the back streets of Chicago were literally running with blood. For this was the meat market of America. Every day, thousands of tons of livestock were industrially turned into dead stock. The slaughter was assisted by the latest technology. Conveyor belts, later to be copied by Henry Ford in his car factories, speeded the gutting and processing of carcasses. But these new technologies, while contributing to Chicago's success, were also turning the city into a cesspit. It was the architects and their skyscrapers that provided the solution. By building upwards, people could flee the mud, blood and shit on the ground. This was the skyscraper's hidden purpose. They were nothing less than an aerial escape from the grim, fetid reality of the modern world below.
The world inside these buildings was ordered, quiet, clean. Here in the Railway Exchange Building, the architects created for their clients a refuge sheathed in white terracotta tiles. They offered a world that was pure, suffused with light, where cleanliness and hygiene stood for progress and civilization. Now this was to become the compelling mission of modernist architecture, its hidden objective. To clean up, to sterilize, to reorder, to eliminate chaos. It was the turn of the new century. But in Europe, the lessons of Chicago had yet to be grasped. Some called it the Great Remedy. They welcomed it as the cleansing that would purge the world of its corrupt ways. It was the Great War. But far from being a healthy spring clean, it was a bloody mess. Modern technology that worked so efficiently in the Chicago slaughterhouses now created human carnage on an untold scale. Those who died by the bullet were lucky. For the rest, had to live in the apocalyptic filth and squalor wrought by the machines of war. The bottom of the trench was springy like a mattress because of all the bodies underneath. At night, when the stench was worse, we tied crepe round our mouths and noses. We were all lousy and we couldn't stop shitting because we'd caught dysentery. We wept, not because we were frightened, but because we were so dirty. Many of Europe's artists fought in the trenches. Now dirt and decay became their obsession. In Germany, a nation crippled by defeat, Otto Dix made wounding and mutilation the central theme of his work. Dix had served in the trenches, and for him the reality of rotting flesh and broken limbs refused to go away. He paid clinical attention to gruesome detail. And he became fascinated with another technological development that came out of the Great War, plastic surgery. For both surgeons and artists, the onslaught of the modern age offered a chance for macabre experiment. Dix's badly reassembled war veterans returned home to chaos and confusion. In Germany, military defeat and the collapse of the old order brought revolution to its cities. Amid the now crumbling remains of the imperial capital, most Berliners were living in misery and squalor, in pre-war housing tenements with little or no sanitation. Conditions everywhere were hopelessly overcrowded. Statistics for tuberculosis and other diseases ran at record levels, comparable to the mad inflation of the Deutschmark. To make matters worse, 80,000 refugees were flooding into Berlin each year. The world was very different after the war. In a certain sense, many of the institutions that had seemed cogent and reasonable prior to the war now seemed bankrupt. And insofar as architecture is related to very, very clearly to public institutions and to public points of view, it changed massively. And so you find, for example, in, 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 certainly in the country that was most open to new building, Germany, because it had lost and it had no reason to hold on to the past, you find any number of experiments moving away from historical precedent. The first experiment was called Expressionism. Infected by the experience of war, it took the form of fevered hallucinations, strange accidents. In a woodland near Bremen, a war memorial commemorates the dead in a style of exaggerated curves and weird protuberances.
Equally strange was the Einstein Tower near Berlin. Built by Erich Mendelssohn as a solar observatory, one critic described it as a flaccid jellyfish. It stands in a bizarre salute to some of the most unrestrained architectural fantasy ever realized. But Expressionism also came up with more purposeful visions, visions of a clean start, of a world bathed in crystal light. The House Atlantis is one of the few remaining examples. The architect Bernard Hötke invited the new man or woman to ascend a long spiral staircase embedded with glass to reach the Hall of Heaven. Here, they were meant to abandon themselves to an instinctive rhythmic dance, to awaken the nature spirit within. Under pagan sun disks, they might transcend their mortal individual form and realize a higher state of consciousness. For Hötke and many of his contemporaries believed that architecture would provide salvation for mankind. And this belief that architecture could and would reshape human society was at the heart of the revolution which was to follow. The experience of the past answers physic and the knife. Surgery must be applied at the city's center. Our world, like a charnel house, is strewn with the detritus of dead epochs. The great task incumbent on us is that of making a proper environment for our existence and clearing away from our cities the dead bones that putrefy in them. Charles Edouard Jeanneret, better known as Le Corbusier, was to become the most influential of all the modernist architects. He was also the most relentlessly absolutist. He proposed to replace the center of Paris with severe concrete tower blocks. Inventor of purism, he loathed expressionism, and he loathed dirt and disorder. In the 1910s, one has to see most of the cities of Europe as dark, black, plague-infested from a point of view of a city planner. And Corbusier, like others, used the metaphor of cancer. In order to cure cancer, you had to get out a scalpel and cut it out. And that's why he designed cities ruthlessly with a, with a knife and cut out the center of Paris and what he proposed instead was, of course, a light-filled set of skyscrapers, white and glass, and free of microbes and streptococci. So the deep metaphor of modernism was that of the operating theater, of the hospital, of a place where the difficulties of everyday life would be expunged, would be fumigated out. Corbusier's vision saw all the world as a building site and it was to be in Germany, a place where the ground had already been cleared, that his solutions would be most widely applied. In 1927, an architectural exhibition opens in Stuttgart. A group of architects say no to the old order and reject its cluttered, dusty ways. In a unique experiment, they design and build a prototype for the new white world of modernism, the Weissenhof Siedlung. The project is organized by Mies van der Rohe. With prophetic insight, he invites the future leaders of modernist architecture to take part. Included are Peter Behrens, Walter Gropius, Hans Scharun, Adolf Schneck, the Taut brothers, and Le Corbusier. Together, they are to make the Weissenhof an international course célèbre. Uh, when I first saw the Weissenhof in, uh, see, when was it, 29, uh, it, it was quite a shock. I never knew there was such a thing possible. 
and uh, of course I knew all the buildings from illustrations, but that anybody could put together a group like that in an actual world uh, where every good architect was included. I mean, it's hard to think of an architect that they left out. If I were making the ideal list today, I couldn't do it because the thing is so uh, diffuse now. There was a, a cleanliness about it, there was a clarity, there was an order and a coherence to this that represented, as one of the critics of the time said, the triumph of the new architecture. And uh, Weissenhof, in, in fact, uh, did a great deal to persuade the whole world that this new kind of architecture was livable and that it, that it, that it was something that human beings could be part of. No architectural experiment before or since has had such impact. The architects had seen the light, and they all agreed about the shape of the future. The old way of living was denounced as bourgeois and unhealthy. Shiny linoleum and stripped interiors replaced the heavy drapes and stuffed furniture. Inside as well as out, the Weissenhof architects linked hygiene to whiteness. I think uh, that the idea that there was white was an idea of purity, very much the idea of glass would make you a healthy person. I mean, the moral uh, approach was uh, definitely important. The Mies, for instance, believed in glass. Everybody believed in glass. Corbusier once wrote, you'd be a better man if you lived in a glass house. Which seems a little odd since I lived in one for 50 years and I never made any better at all. Uh, but the moral part we don't take seriously anymore, anyhow. But that was a great moral thing. I believed it. And that um, belief system then became the ideology of modern architecture. You know, architects started to really believe that if you could change architecture, you could change society. Now that's extraordinary. That's what's called today architectural determinism. You know, put people in new clothes, new houses, and they'll come out with new thoughts. I mean, it's a crazy idea, but you can see at the end of Towards a New Architecture, Corbusier says even, architecture or revolution you know, one or the other. You can either have social revolution or you can have good architecture. And if you have good architecture, you don't need social revolution. The lamps, the chairs, the tables, even the forks and spoons, these were seen as the building blocks of the new society. The belief was that the correct design would change the world and the people who lived in it. The Bauhaus was at the cutting edge of this revolution. The school became famous for its industrially produced geometric design. But it hadn't always been like this. In its early years, the Bauhaus had been more like an eccentric commune, a kind of hostel for outlandish mystics and wandering prophets with names like Christ II and Genghis Khan. And then there was the master of weaving, Johannes Itten. He was a committed follower of the cult of Mazdaznan, which involved punishing rituals of fasting and body purges. The Mazdaznan experiment was a total fiasco. The students who fell for it broke out in terrible rashes and sores, and fainted from malnutrition. With the departure of Itten from the Bauhaus in 1923, the school's romantic period ended. Another Bauhaus teacher, Oskar Schlemmer, welcomed the end of this hippie phase and announced the age of the machine for living in. At that time, there was a great belief that technology and the machine could provide us with an orderliness, with a germ-free environment, with advantages that the old crafts-oriented societies could not provide us with. There was something beautiful and hopeful about that.
As the economic and political situation of Weimar Germany stabilized in the late 20s, the opportunity came at last for the new architecture to establish itself. White, flat-roofed housing projects sprang up all over Germany, like here at the Weissestadt or White City in Berlin. Thousands were moved from the dereliction of slum housing to apartments that had electricity, heating and bathrooms. When I was there, there's no question it felt like a revolution. We've had none since uh, in our field, quite like that. It was uh, in the air, it's hard to describe, but it was, uh, everybody was going in the same direction, all feeling a new world was at hand. And it was actually being done. Now we regret that it isn't being done, but we don't get around to doing anything about it. It was a different feeling. Alongside the housing projects, communal facilities for washing and bathing were built. Heinrich Tessenau's Stadtbad in Berlin invited the new man and the new woman to come forth. They were themselves conceived in the pattern of the new architecture. Clean, fit, well-proportioned, stripped down. For the brave new world, here were the brave new heroes. This vision of a new man came from thinking of the body in biological terms. Out was the old classical image of a beautiful, well-proportioned body. In was the human being as a properly functioning body machine. All over Germany, the craze for the new body beautiful captured the popular imagination. Set in the hills south of Stuttgart, the Haus auf der Alb was built in 1930 by Adolf Schneck as a holiday retreat for workers. It sits in the landscape like a cruise liner, positioned to take best advantage of the light, sun and air. And like a ship, it's ringed with balconies, viewing decks, sun terraces. At a time when the only treatment for tuberculosis was exposure to the sun, no one doubted that this was a therapeutic place. The holidaymakers were each assigned a sparsely furnished cabin, a single bed, a small cupboard, and of course, a wash basin. They followed a carefully organized daily regime of exercise, long walks, healthy eating, and early to bed. The house after Alb delivered its message of clean Spartan values with meticulous efficiency. To someone like Le Corbusier, this message was a crucial part of the new doctrine. Health, he said, was a moral imperative. In fact, he started playing basketball. His friend, Dr. Pierre Winter, told him uh, he must exercise more. And so he stopped working at night and he, he, he played basketball twice a week. And he said, that uh, gave me moral power. Imagine, he said, his morality came from playing basketball twice a week. He credited that. He also said, you know, um, one must box. And there are wonderful drawings of a man pummeling away at this uh, punching bag, stuck up on an elevated, uh, suspended garden, looking out over a pure nature, while his wife uh, admiringly sees that he's working off his excess energy and becoming <laughs> a healthy citizen of the new state. The story of Le Corbusier's friendship with the fascist doctor Pierre Winter is a neglected one. They became friends in the 1920s 
and for a while formed a kind of double act. Le Corbusier invited Dr. Winter to write articles about the new body for his magazine L'Esprit Nouveau, The New Spirit. A truly new mind can only exist in a new body. We need to realize that the most formidable discovery of our era is health. We need air. We want to feel the full force of the sun on our bare skin. The human body is going to reappear naked in the sunlight, showered, muscular and supple, and it will be beautiful. Le Corbusier was able to put these ideas into practice when he built the Villa Savoie near Paris. Le Corbusier designed the Villa Savoie for the Savoie family so they could escape from Paris on the weekends and uh, get out of the filthy city and come to what he called a Virgilian landscape worthy of Homer. You approach the Villa Savoie, being very careful to drive between the columns, the piloti, and the green building. Because Le Corbusier designed it as the steering radius of his then car, Citroën, and if you don't steer correctly, you're likely to bring part of the house down on the back of your neck. Le Corbusier conceived of his houses as architectural promenades. You came, came through the front door, took off your scarf, put it on a table, and looked at what was in effect a cubist composition, pure table, pure column, pure lighting element. So you continued on the architectural promenade, first of all, to wash your hands and purify yourself. You wash your hands at a sink here, a pure industrial object. Having been purified, you turn around and then you continue up the architectural promenade, hitting the ramp. This is one of his first big ramps he put in his house, and it's something that he wanted to uh, get you into by allowing you to come through a house like an automobile driving on a highway. So in this sense, the house is a machine for moving in, and you're the automobile coming up a racetrack. You come into this part of the house, you're halfway up, and the ramp goes shooting through the whole space, and suddenly, light bursts in from one side. It's extraordinary, you don't expect so much light, suffusing the house, making it even more pure. And you approach the hanging garden, gardens in the air, and you see the place where you're headed, the solarium at the top. That's the goal. So Le Corbusier thought of this building really as a promenade up into space and into the cosmos. But one of the most important things of it was his notion of architecture as pure form. In fact, in 1923, he defined architecture famously in the following way. He said, architecture is a masterly, correct, and magnificent play of volumes seen in sunlight, pure volumes. And here, you really get a sense of what he meant, a smokestack a nice curvilinear form, something very voluptuous, almost feminine. And you can imagine people taking off their clothes and having sunbathing in the nude. This was very much an important part of the house. In fact, he rather idealized Madame Savoie up here on the weekend, getting neat, clean, and healthy. You can see in this house, uh, elevated off the ground, his theory that a building should be stuck on stilts in order to avoid the humidity and unhealthiness of the ground, as opposed, say, to green people today, green architecture, organic architecture, which says, you know, you must get closer to the ground and the earth because it's healthy. He took the reverse view, and he was justifying it by uh, talking to doctors and so forth. So sun and wind and light were meant to fumigate, as it were, the, the unhealthiness of the city. Well, Corbusier, of course, described his own way of living when he decided how you should live. And he, being a good uh, Swiss uh, Calvinist, knew perfectly well uh, that you, you, you don't slop around in a Roman way uh, in a glass house. You, uh, you're very correct, and you sit up straight, and you, you face the world, you know, and all the moral virtues. Le Corbusier's wife, Yvonne, was never wholly sold on her husband's missionary spirit of purification. 
when he put a bidet by the marital bed, she knitted a large tea cosy to cover it. And she wasn't altogether convinced about the spiritual or physical benefits of his architecture. All this light is killing me, driving me crazy, she said. The Museum of Hygiene, Dresden, opened in 1930. Paid for by a man who made millions selling Odol mouthwash, it was one of the largest and most popular museums of its day. Known as the Temple of the New Man, it was a unique shrine, a place where science, social theory, and aesthetics met. Progressing through a pantheon of the great scientists and physicians, the visitor arrived at the inner sanctum to find the museum's presiding deity, the transparent body. One of the museum's main teaching tools, the transparent body was a revolutionary device, enabling people to see for the first time the inner secrets of their bodies. The first model had used a real skeleton. Painstakingly assembled, each vein was a network of copper wires turned by hand. Today, they still make transparent men and women in the museum's workshops. Indeed, under communism, this was one of the few successful production lines in East Germany. Such was their success, they were toured over five continents. We've built 86 female figures and 82 males in glass since 1945. Can you describe the first reactions people had to the transparent man? They were simply fascinated. The man was shown with his arms stretched upwards towards the sky, praying, reaching for light, 
striving for fame and honor. That's how it was presented. As well as celebrating the body, the museum was also delivering a stern lesson. Visitors were confronted with wax reproductions of body parts eaten away by disease, cancer, syphilis, by unhealthy living. The idea of setting up a museum of hygiene seems rather bizarre to us today. You can only understand it in the context of that time. It was a new place, offering public information, prophylaxis, health education. But at the same time, it exerted an enormous fascination on people, not just the ordinary people who came in off the street, but also artists. Schlemmer, for example, was completely fascinated by the museum. He said, since I've been there, and he wrote this in his diary as well, I have an idea that the old religion no longer exists that a new religion has taken its place, that is, a religion that lives inside people and which exalts anatomy, the body, its functions, and gives these a spiritual dimension. The body has become a substitute for religion. The Bauhaus teacher Oskar Schlemmer was one of many artists drawn to the Museum of Hygiene. He was so moved by the transparent body that he decided to give lectures about it, both at the Bauhaus and later at the museum itself. The fascination that the transparent body held for artists and architects is a critical moment in modernism. For a movement obsessed with technology, here was the metaphor it was looking for, the body as a machine for living in. In fact, the Bauhaus could be described as a school of anatomy as much as anything else. Ideas about the body, how it works, how to make it work better, informed just about everything it produced. But the transparent body was an ideal. It could not and did not always match with reality. This seemed to escape the notice of Le Corbusier, who organized his buildings around another abstract model, the body modular. Using this standard system of measurement, he came up with a corridor in his house at the Weissenhof that was no wider than the corridor in a train. This narrow hallway made tempers run high. People with beer bellies tended to get stuck in it. This architecture was clearly signed. No excess weight, no personal clutter, no knickknacks. Everything, including your paunch and your past, must be left behind. You're right. The, we are trying to create, we were trying to create under Kobe's leadership, a, uh, a thing that would be inhuman in the sense that it wasn't taking into account uh, their foibles and their interests, but would uh, legislate totalitarian-wise, a, a style for everybody that would, they might or might not like, and that was that direction. There is a certain implicit um, tyranny in this view of a world which has to look the way the Weissenhof Siedlung looked. What do you do with people who prefer to live messier lives, less ordered uh, lives, who are not happy living on the surface of a Mondrian painting. Uh, there's very little room made for them in, the, in, the, in, 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 that, in that world. In fact, uh, it's, there's, a, there's an irony here that in a way, the National Socialists come on with much the same view. Uh, they don't want the diseased uh, to be part of their world. They don't want the gypsies to be part of their world. They don't want the homosexuals or the Jews to be part of their world. They want, in a way, a world that is every bit as clean in their terms as any of the modernist architects in the 1920s did in theirs.
Was wir uns unter der deutschen Jugend der Zukunft wünschen, ist etwas anderes, als das die Vergangenheit sich gewünscht hat. Wir müssen einen neuen Menschen werden, auf das unser Volk nicht an den typischen Degenerationserscheinungen dieser neuen Zeit runde geht. Serried ranks of National Socialists. The metaphor of the body was also central to the Nazi Reich. Hitler was conceived as the brain. The body of the people was now a total organism, functioning like a finely tuned machine. They took two things from modernity. One was, of course, the machine, the notion that the machine would liberate society and that they had to industrialize everything. And they also shared this notion of the importance of exercise strength through joy, through uh, health camps, through living clean. And you can see in the Hitler Youth the kind of ideal type of Corbusier transformed into a Germanic, an Aryan, blonde hair, blue eyed type. Hygiene, or rather this idea of the new, complete and properly functioning human being, has two sides, one good and one bad. The good side is that the old, the dismal, the incomplete is left behind. The bad side is that these new ideas don't allow any deviations. As soon as these new ideals are fixed, not only are irregularities not permitted, they must also be removed from society, or as the National Socialists finally concluded, eradicated. And so in the Third Reich, it became a very small step from keeping a check on the body of the people to actually eliminating those parts which don't fit. Victims of the Past was made in 1937 and shown in every cinema in Germany. Alles Lebensschwache geht in der Natur unfehlbar zugrunde. Wir Menschen haben gegen dieses Gesetz der natürlichen Auslese in den letzten Jahrzehnten furchtbar gesündigt. Wir haben unwertes Leben nicht nur erhalten, wir haben ihm auch Vermehrung gewährt. Die Nachkommen dieser Kranken sahen so aus. Das deutsche Volk kennt das ganze Ausmaß dieses Elends wohl kaum. Es kennt nicht den drückenden Geist jener Häuser, in denen Tausende lallende Schwachsinnige künstlich ernährt und gepflegt werden müssen, die tiefer stehen als jedes Tier. In 1935, Bauhaus teacher Herbert Bayer had designed a poster for the Nazi exhibition The Miracle of Life. The Museum of Hygiene sent 22 trucks of exhibits. Ideas about racial hygiene were used to launch an offensive on the avant-garde. One of the chief stands was organized by an architect, Paul Schulze Naumburg. He compared photographs of mentally and physically handicapped people with modern art. His message was shockingly simple. Abstraction in art was the byproduct of insanity. And like the insane, it was a threat to the body of the people. The Nazis played to conservative popular taste. They despised abstraction in architecture as much as in art. Hitler, himself a trained architect, favoured the chosen style of dictators, neoclassicism. Its reference to the great civilizations of ancient Greece and Rome gave this architecture authority. It spoke the language of power, pure and simple. Projects like the Weissenhof clearly failed to meet this requirement. And to the Nazis, this white world was anything but pure. Several of its architects were communists or Jews and the buildings were clearly influenced by Mediterranean and Moorish styles. 
with its filthy cosmopolitanism, it sullied the pure Aryan gene pool. The Weissenhof was now depicted mockingly on postcards as an Arab settlement. But for all their differences, the Nazis and the modernists did have something in common, an obsession with creating a new order. A lot of people today, a lot of sociologists and philosophers are talking about the Nazis as modernists, reactionary modernists, but modernists nevertheless. And it's interesting that, of course, Le Corbusier, the greatest of the modernists, Mies van der Rohe, the second greatest, and Walter Gropius, maybe the third greatest, all of them, in many ways, compromised with the upcoming fascists. Uh, Mies van der Rohe remains in Germany up until 1937 designing Nazi buildings with swastikas in them. Le Corbusier goes to Pétain in 1941, tries to design for the new fascist state of France and even writes letters to Mussolini. And Gropius writes to Goebbels and designs the Reichsbank for the Nazis. And that's the historic compromise. And it occurs because at a deep level, they share the same world view. Wilhelm Kreis, Adolf Schneck, Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, Peter Behrens, and there were others, all looked for work from the Nazis. I met, met most of those architects, but by the time I met them at the end of the decade, they were pretty well entrenched in the capitalist system. In other words, they also wanted jobs. That's really all that architects want, isn't it? Employment. I mean, all our ideals we have when we're young go by the board. I mean, if we see a job coming. If the Nazis were not going to be patrons, the modernists had to look elsewhere. And inevitably, they turned to America where most of Europe's outlawed or out-of-work artists had already been warmly received. Now, of course, the architects were also welcomed. For they offered corporate America precisely the style it was looking for. Mies van der Rohe, by now in his mid-fifties and barely able to speak English, settled in Chicago. Of all his peers, he was to have the greatest impact on American architecture. He was less burdened, perhaps, than the others by idealism. He seemed happy to offer the achievements of modernism to a culture that was looking for a style, not a utopian program. Heavily sponsored by the American corporations, modernism now became cleansed of its social and political content. And it became, for a period at least, the official style. The Seagram building in New York was the apotheosis of this style. For the corporate man, this was an architecture which invited efficiency and a sense of purpose. The building came with a set of rules which are still religiously applied blinds must be drawn to one of three levels at all times. The lobby must be free of extraneous furnishings. Employees' desks must have no personal clutter. It was the joint endeavor of Mies and his then admirer, Philip Johnson. I think the Mies aesthetic gets to be a boring aesthetic, and so we all quit. I only quit Miesism because I was bored to death. I mean, Mies himself copied himself all over the place. He didn't care. Once he, he said, well, I gave you the, the ultimate building, the Seagram building, so go and build them. God bless you, you see. And all of his own, under his own name, came out these uh, cheaper buildings, you see. So uh, it all got, no, boring isn't a bad word. They all ended up designing big corporate headquarter buildings. And those buildings were very severe, very um, reduced, and represented power. And in that sense, 
They represent a betrayal of everything that early modernists fought for. Because the modern movement was really not fought to make life uh, safe for Seagram Whiskey and the corporations. You know, at the end of the day, the corporations are not what modernism is about.